Ir tomando asiento, por favor. Vamos a comenzar. Please take a seat. Bien. Ongi etorri arratsaldeon. Good afternoon. And for el hidrógeno renovable. So, welcome to this seminar about uh, green hydrogen as an essential factor for industrial transition towards a fair transition in the future of industry organized by the Federation of Industry, Construction and other thanks to Yuji Tifica and Anastasio Gracia that, as you know very well, uh, this foundation is promoted by Yuji Tifica. Uh, apart from um, having everyone following this uh, from here, or those of the participants who are here, this can be followed by the U UGT FICA website as well as the Fundación Anastasio, uh, who is also providing the streaming services. And we know that everyone in Europe is following this from a streaming um, platform, given the relevance of this seminar at this moment. We want to thank. Uh, industry all global union and the bus government for the sponsoring in order to celebrate this seminar today in this wonderful uh, venue as you can see in our program we have a very broad um number of speakers at the uh, entrepreneurial sector, trade union sectors, as well as uh, institutional representatives. So without further delay, we are going to begin this opening session, giving the floor to our Secretary General from the trade union, UGT FICA. Antonio, you have now the floor. Buenas tardes. Hello, good afternoon. I would like to give you a very warm welcome. As the moderator said, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, seminar. I would like to express my appreciation from UGT, FICA, and Euskadi uh, to all of those who made possible to have this seminar here in Bilbao. And hopefully, all of you, during these next days, you will be able to enjoy not only the seminar and the work that we are going to develop today and tomorrow, but also the city. Uh, here in Euskadi, in the Basque Country, when we talk about energy, and we've been talking about energy for many, many years, and the reason for that is that when we talk about energy, we're talking about industry, and we are talking about transition. And when we talk about industry, we know that we've been suffering for many years how different things are in our country compared to uh, other countries and how difficult it is to achieve competitiveness from the energy perspective. We are fighting at the trade unions. This is the uh, topic that I'm going to cover now uh, here so that these inequalities uh, are reduced and we have an equipable situation to the ones of other countries and we do not suffer any risks. Could you apologize, but I'm under the spotlight and I'm totally blinded. Me podéis disculpar, pero es que el faro... Could you apologize, but unfortunately I'm totally blinded by the light. Is it possible to reduce the intensity of it? Because I was saying that in the past country, we have a huge concern about energy. We've been fighting for energy not to be a discriminatory uh, factor. It's not a deficient factor for the competitiveness of our corporations. And right now, we're in a complicated situation. We are suffering a crisis that very often is understood in a negative way, from a negative perspective. And in these current circumstances of great uncertainty, we can start thinking about the future of our economy, our industry, and our own development. And I'm saying this because up until now, the growth that we've seen in the energy sector and its relevance in the industry 
Well, we thought that in the transformation into green uh, energies, we were going to be able to tackle sectors as relevant as uh, wind sector, solar sector, and we thought that in 15 years time, they were going to mature and they were going to allow society to grow into a fair transition so that our uh, households, our uh, industries will stop suffering this energy poverty, as we call it here. But after these many years, we realized that the population continues suffering because of the energy crisis and the cost of energy instead of going down after having a mature energy and after them being amortized, the cost is still grow and prevents our our industries from being competitive. So we're doing something wrong. Definitely we're doing something wrong. And now we have the opportunity of changing our trajectory. 20 years ago, we thought that we were having the wrong energy mix. And now we have to go into another energy mix that will allow us to have a good balance that will make our industries uh, competitive. So we have a better energy uh, generation at a lower cost. If we insist on our errors, we'll find ourselves with problems in the future, problems that will affect families and entrepreneurs. And transition, which has not been just or fair, not up until now, could continue on being so. We might end up doing powerful investment. We can find in front of us important technological developments, but this doesn't give rise to a fair transition. I think we have to allow uh, technologies to develop in a natural way so that in the future they can be applied in an appropriate manner. We cannot, uh, of course, there will be sectors that will be dependent from a type of energy, but we have many different type of sectors. We're talking about um, the uh, shipbuilding sector. And of course, we're not going to go back to sailing, but we will have to go look for energies that do not um, produce a lot of CO2 emissions. And when we talk about fair transition, we are saying that we cannot uh, run too much. We cannot force sectors to carry out changes when technology is not fully developed. We have to give them some time so that these industrial sectors are not sentence today not to develop because they cannot stop producing CO2 emissions because they don't have enough technology as not to do it. In the mid long term, of course, they will have to do it. But at the end, we will have to reach uh, net zero in terms of CO2 emissions, but it will take a time if we want to have a fair transition. That's all that I wanted to say. Today and tomorrow, we are going to learn a lot. We're going to have a very important seminar and we'll be able to share and exchange experiences amongst trade unions and different speakers coming from different countries, providing a lot of knowledge and enriching in all of us, not only today, but also tomorrow. So maybe we can draw good conclusions from the seminar. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Antonio, por tu Thank you very much, Antonio, for your um, presentation. It was a un wonderful introduction, introduction, Amy, and having a good seminar during the rest of the seminar. Now we're going to give the floor to a person who participated in the organization of this seminar. It wouldn't have been possible without the collaboration of the uh, Regional Ministry for Economic Development, Sustainability, and Environment, Arantza Tapia Otegi. It, without her, it wouldn't have been possible to have this seminar. So without further ado, we give you the floor so you can inaugurate the seminar. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, on behalf of the Basque government, uh, let me tell you on, uh, and give you a very welcome to the Basque country, to Bilbao. To those of you who are here and to those of you who are following these sessions by uh, streaming. 
So thank you for being here with us and uh, we are only a collaborator in this uh, session. And let me tell you some words in, in Basque. You know, we have a known language, which is Basque, and let me say some words in, in Basque. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to the UGT Union for organizing this Congress in the Basque Country. It is a topical issue. Um, but in this country, we have been talking about the situation and difficulty of energy for a long time. So you have hit the nail on the head and it is to be congratulated. The future of energy, industrial transformation and food transformation, it's a major issue and with essential approach that the industrial transformation might take into account society and the people and the working uh, companies. Eh, buenas tardes a todos y gracias al Sindicato UGT por organizar este congreso en Euskadi. Well, first of all, thanking UGT for choosing Bilbao to organize this session. We are mere collaborators, but we're truly happy of having you here and having this session here. As I was saying in uh, Basque, the issue of energy is a very hot topic at this very moment, and industry and energy are going to be intertwined in the future as they are today, and we have to make sure that we make the right decisions for the future. We are immersed in this triple transition that we keep on talking about and of course we have to work jointly in this triple transition we're talking about digital and technological transition transition but also on the energy and climate transition without forgetting the health and the society transition I mean at a better society more prosperous society having people at the core at the center of it and it is for us to carried out this transformation. We talk about balance, we talk about sustainability, we talk about environmental, economic, and social um, sustainability. One doesn't exist without the other. And in that sense, from the Basque country, we have to uh, guide the actions in this regard. We need to be innovative, and we have a challenging um, task ahead of us since 2020 at the Basque Country, we decided to uh, change the organization of the uh, ministry, fostering economic development. Yes, of course, but in a sust sustainable and inclusive way. What do we mean by this? We want to reactivate the economy, creating jobs, quality jobs that will assume the transformation that we were talking about as an opportunity to strengthen the competitiveness of our economic structure and integrating our environmental aspect, not as a factor that it is a precondition, but as a competitiveness factor, an opportunity to diversify it and to improve our industry. In September 2021, also, we signed the uh, Basque Social Pact for a fair transition towards Industry 4.0, an agreement chaired by our uh, regional president and fostered by the industry group in the social dialogue dialogue uh, uh, negotiations that we have here in Euskadi. In the past years, we agreed that our industrial evolution in our Basque Industry 4.0 strategy, in our digital strategy, has to be based on people and having people at the center, at the very core of it. And after many years working, we reached this agreement with many entities represented in this social dialogue desk, with the participation of UGT as one of the main social partners. Partners. This agreement made us analyze where we were coming from, but above all, made us think about where we were heading to, because we wanted to continue on supporting the industry. And I was talking about this with Pedro in the past. We had an industry session in Vitoria some years ago, uh, wondering where the industry was going to, supporting the industrial sector with quality jobs and jobs that are necessary in the future. We had an industrial past in the Basque Country, and we want to have an industrial future, a more modern technological and digital industry 
but also a more sustainable industry, more adapted to the times and more transformed. These reflections, these commitments were taken to this agreement that we have just mentioned, that it is very relevant and that we want to communicate the value of it, but we want also to intensify these actions. We need to reskill our workers, workers in our industrial sector who will need to carry out different jobs, different tasks. But without forgetting the energy factor. Energy factor with many concerns that we have right now on the table in terms of our power bills, power bills paid by our industries and by our households. We all, all our families keep on getting uh, power bills that keep on increasing day after day and that we need to pay for. But this energy transition will help us to transform the industry and consider new sectors that didn't exist before that we've never thought of. Uh, companies in need to support sustainability no matter what. And we have to say that the industrial fabric and the industrial entrepreneurs in the Basque Country have done their job. And they started uh, reducing their CO2 emissions. And I have to give you some information about the reduction of CO2 emissions between 2005 and 2009. Uh, reduction have taken place by 26%. And that's not true. Trivia. Uh, industry is not the only responsible of CO2 emissions. On the contrary, they're doing a good job and they're working to achieve this uh, net zero. We said that we needed to turn around an industrial fabric in our model, and I think this is what we're doing hand in hand with all the people, starting with the people at the administration and ending with the last worker at the last industry. Being the industry, one of the main factors in which we are undertaking this type of task, we need to lead by example. We have to be the ones doing things differently. And we are not going to accept the criticism done to the industry in the fight for climate change. We're not responsible for all the things that are done wrongly. On the contrary, we are responsible to carry out and adopting important measures and doing transformations, not only digital transformation, but trying to fulfill environmental requirements. And one of the greatest challenges in that sense is the decarbonization challenge. And when we talk about about decarbonization, we're not limited to electrification, electrification of vehicles, transport, but what happens with low long haul transport with the trucks in our roads, what's happened with the shipping sector, with the uh, airline sector, we need different solutions that are not limited to electrification. And in that sense, the role play by hydrogen is going to be key. We are at a starting point, but it is the moment to support certain technologies and certain investments to develop a new sector that not only take advantage of uh, energy from other places, but developing our own technology, our own corporations, our own industry, and in creating new jobs, jobs adapted to the new times. We have a specific project. Some of you uh, have learned about them this morning, and you will have the opportunity of analyzing them tomorrow in greater depth, such as the Basque Corridor of Hydrogen, presenting two projects that will start immediately. One of them is starting to introduce hydrogen in all gas pipelines. We are uh, very gas dependent. This is something that you're very much aware of. Gas coming from Algiers or from Russia, coming in um, LNG uh, ships. And we have to start replacing that gas on little by little. So we have a project to introduce this hydrogen in the gas pipelines, and we need to know how much can we introduce, how much can they uh, bear, how much can uh, be accepted by this material, and how much uh, can uh, withstand these uh, pumps, etc. So um, in we are also in having another project, the decarbonization hub. We, ha we have just started building in Bilbao to replace fossil fuels by fuels that are differential at this moment and that help us 
to achieve net zero, we're going to a net zero, the one that we want to achieve in 2050, and these are synthetic uh, fuels. They're going to be part of the solution, not the only solution, but part of the solution. But to do that, we need to generate hydrogen, green hydrogen, through energy that it is renewable. So we have important challenges ahead of us and great opportunities ahead of us, and it is the moment to work jointly. And that's why I said that UGT has done a good job organizing this seminar and putting the spotlight on the issue to analyze experiences that are happening worldwide and to find out how things are being done. What role can uh, green hydrogen play, play and how is it being used in different countries? In the creation of the Basque ecosystem, we all uh, hold a responsibility in our own positions, but we need to work jointly uh, public is in the public sphere and in the private sphere to serve the industry and to serve mobility in the Basque country. We are responding to a great need that we have and that we notice on a daily basis. Two pieces of information. The support of the green hydrogen will entail more than 1.3 billion euros investment, uh, mainly coming from the private sector, also public, but mainly from the private sector. And we're going to have around 1,340 new jobs, direct jobs, and more than 6,500 indirect jobs. This is something that it is worth supporting. And above all, we are going to be there to have this energy and industrial transformation. That's why we need to be all prepared and we need to give the best of ourselves because we're going to need it. We're aware of the fact that this energy and climate transition has to be done on time, but also with good planning. The objectives for 2050 are prepared, but how are we going to do it? Today is 2022. We still have 28 years until 2050. We need to know what we're going to do on a yearly basis and how we're going to be working in order to achieve our goals. A fair and an orderly transition. And that was all that I had to say. Skerri Casco, thank you very much, and I wish you a very fruitful seminar. Us and have a very fruitful session today and tomorrow. And if you have time, consider the, uh, spending a, a good time here in this beautiful city in Bilbao. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much to the regional ministry for her uh, words of introduction. What she said was really interesting, and she said that having this seminar on this topic, it's uh, being done here not uh, out of casualty, but uh, because uh, they are advancing in their achievement of the reduction of CO2 emissions. Those are the policies that need to be uh, developed by governments. And now we're going to give the floor to the video that was sent to us by Mikhail Basiliadis, who is the uh, president of the industry all Europe. Beglückwünsche euch zur Durchführung dieser Konferenz zu den wichtigen Zukunft. Uh, hello, uh, and congratulate you for organizing this seminar on green hydrogen. It's a shame I cannot be with all of you uh, today uh, face to say. However, I send you a very warm welcome on behalf of industry, all Europe, and also in my uh, behalf of my own trade union, IGBGE. Last month of November, uh, we had an industrial policy meeting in Madrid talking about the demands of industrial policy. And we uh, spoke with the Spanish government and we discussed several aspects, aspects that have to do with different sectors, the metal sector, chemical sector, pharmaceutical sector. And we also debated the production of uh, environmental hydrogen or green hydrogen, a project that it is of uh, great relevance with very specific objectives in the Basque Hydrogen Corridor, eh, eh, where we're going to be seeing this, the BH2C. Uh, so this is very important today and tomorrow. This is what we have to do so that Europe can build their own capacities for the production of green hydrogen. 
Without a doubt, during the course of this seminar, you will detail in uh, many examples of this. There is a consortium, the Spanish Hydrogen Network, that was created in February last year. And it's going to participate in all the value change. I see that this uh, Basque Country Hydrogen Corridor is, is going to be a very important stance towards an industrial decarbonized industry, and it will be a step in our network in all Europe. And it's important that to be interconnected. We have to interconnect our hydrogen production in the mid long term to guarantee the self-sufficiency of Europe with this type of green hydrogen. I don't know if this is going to be the, uh, enough at the end due to the great amount that it is necessary for the industry. But we know that the supply of industrial feedback through the pipeline is safer than the delivery through special ships. So through these tankers. And if it's necessary, we can transport these natural gas in these tankers so that we will eliminate the bottleneck uh, problems that we have in our connections. That's why my opinion is that it is very important to undertake this gas pipeline product between Catalonia and France that has been um, cancelled. It is for all of us the production of green hydrogen at industrial uh, um, amounts that it is very important. In, it's a new uh, industry field. And that's the reason why the development of the hydrogen capacities and the use uh, of uh, these um, fuel cells could be uh, relevant in the production of synthetic fuels as a way to have a good transition and a fair transition, especially in regions where there is a high need of jobs uh, due to mining and other industries. And this is offering it's a great opportunity. Only this way, we will be able to avoid in full region suffering and being left behind in terms of the development compared to the rest of the country. And this is what we have in mind in Germany in 2019 when we decided to create the commission for the change of uh, employment and uh, structure uh, to progressively reduce uh, um, brown um, coal industry. Of course, these in the Europeans, we have to say nothing over us but without us. And that's how industry all Europe was created and we are advancing in our debates uh, with our different organizations, with all of our members. We've had this manifesto of industry all Europe. What is it about? Above all, it's about five aspects that we are going to demand from the European Commission, but also from our national governments. On one hand, a change of the structure of our industry. That's why we need an industrial policy in the sense of a climate change policies and also in the creations of high quality jobs. The financing of this industry needs to be guaranteed by our politicians. Any delay will have negative consequences for the workers in the future. And that's why we need to create a very broad industrial policy. A change in the industrial, in the industry, in the in a structure can only be successful if all the stakeholders participate. That's why we need to in reinforce the collective bargaining and social dialogue. We need to plan and set up the changes in advance for all of the workers and for all the entrepreneurs so that they can participate in the decision-making processes in the different strategies at the national, local, and regional level, and even at European level. This can also help us to reinforce the social dialogue. And this is something that it is quite obvious. In order to face the new uh, reskilling requirements of the industry, but also to undergo other industrial transformation that is necessary to have this financing and legal certainty so we can have uh, quality uh, jobs and an ongoing learning. 
This includes also conditions in a special framework for education and training that are absolutely required and they need to be provided and financed by the state and by the corporations. Dear colleagues, this morning you've already visited the Zamudio Technological Park and you've been able to have a good idea about the new technology that they have in this plant. I think that this is a very important point as well. And uh, you will probably got in your own impression after talking to the workers and knowing not only about the theoretical aspects of this uh, change of the structure towards a decarbonized industry, but also you've been able to take a look at all of the opportunities that they have in it, and you have been able to discuss it with this worker. In this search, I wish you a very good um, impressions, new knowledge which are necessary and fruitful debates with a good results for your trade union work, for your union work, and uh, to better help your workers and their families over the coming years. We need many initiatives, initiatives of this guys within industry or with the necessary support to transform our industry and with the participation of all of our workers. I would like to thank you for this industrial policy conference, looking at the present but also at the future. I'm really proud that we have a uh, organizers that are members of industry all supporting our claims for the future, even if we don't have enough support in Europe, very often from the entrepreneurs and very often from the governments. But this is how we work in our uh, union work with the workers, so we do not leave anyone behind. So good luck and we wish you all the best. Well, once that the opening session has finished, well, I would like to thank Mikhail Vasiliaris for his welcoming words. I think he spoke clearly about the need uh, for us to participate, not just international trade unions, but also the Spanish trade unions in the definition of these technological and industrial advancements. And I think this is defined by one he said, nothing about us without us. So, and with that, we'll start the opening session. And we're going to start with the first panel, a roadmap of the hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen, the strategy of the Spanish government. We're going to have Teresa Rivera, the Vice President and Minister for Tr Ecologic Transition and Demographic Challenge. But in the end, she wasn't able to come, unfortunately, this wonderful auditorium. And that's why she sent us this video that we're going to show you now. The last few days, in these days that we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Sustainable uh, Conference and how to ensure human progression with limited resources, we know, we remember how the end of the era of fossil fuels will be key in order to guarantee sustainability in the environment in order to be able to mm, guarantee uh, good climate for us. This is not something that happens overnight, but we all know that it's been too long now since we have been transforming our strategic uh, infrastructures, and it will be necessary to replace the more intensive strategies in terms of fossil fuels with others that are cleaner. In terms of electricity, we do have very efficient technologies already. We know that some energy consumptions linked to natural gas which are in the process of it, will not be very easily replaced. And that's why going to green hydrogen, renewable hydrogen is going to be key in order to ensure the full decarbonization of our economy for 2050. In order to do that, well, this uh, presents many opportunities in terms of employment, innovation, industry, equipment uh, manufacturing and uh, protection and the green hydrogen included in new applications or in the current industrial activities will be tested over the next few years. An ecosystem that is highly complex where different uh, pieces have representation and capital in our country where the natural trend to consolidate, consolidate clean industrial processes that are modern, new activities that allow us to guarantee 
a reasonable percentage, appropriate percentage of the industrial uh, production in the whole economy is necessary. And that's why we know that the involvement of trade unions, companies, um, workers, and civil society and administration is going to be key. We also know that we need to have the professional qualifications that allow us to make the most of all the opportunities and of all the value chain, and that's going to be very important. That is why the fact that over the next two days we're going to think about the contribution based on that cluster with those industrial applications that exist in the Basque country is one of the best questions and one of the best areas where to continue delving into the changes that we need to promote. Spain has a renewable hydrogen roadmap. It also has a specific plan, a strategic plan for our economy that promotes renewable energies, hydrogen and storage. It also has a framework that will need to be changed, modernized and uh, restructured in order to include it and include all the technical issues and safety issues that will make it possible for us to deploy the hydrogen value chain in uh, total safety. And we are not alone. The European Commission presented in the Repower EU program an initiative that increases significantly the hydrogen objectives for 2030. Spain is in good conditions to go beyond that 10% that was set as our goal for Europe. Uh, and we know we've seen great interest from all the industrial tissue in Spain. In the open tenders, we have both for the necessary equipment and for the, in order to produce hydrogen, but also those uh, open tenders for the testing of um, factories that use renewable hydrogen and also something that will allow us to have hydrogen valleys has uh, pre have presented much more than what we expected to receive in the public tender with a partnership and alliances that are very exciting with industrial partners, classic energy partners, energy um, trans transport companies, and also the search of uh, technological companies, as well as the end uses of hydrogen. So an ecosystem that is full of big, medium-sized, and small players, new and old, that aim to guarantee the success of the hydrogen adventure in Spain. And the Basque country plays a key role here. It has a great capacity. The Basque Hydrogen Corridor represents, as uh, very few others do, that desire to work together along the same uh, path, not just in terms of industrial and institutional support, but also the clear will of all the workers and trade unions that also see this as an opportunity. And they see that it is possible to create over 1,500 jobs related to the development of this new initiative that links many different uh, players along the corridor. Over 1.3 billion public and private have been, will be, used from now until 2026 in order to unite the will of different players, but also to test the goal and the uses that hydrogen will provide us over the next few years. And that's why, and also because of many other reasons, hosting this uh, seminar such at such an early stage that allows us to define the framework that will allow us to go forward and pursue these opportunities is very relevant. And so I wish you a great conference. I wish I was there with you, but I know that together you will present not just great ideas, but also fantastic projects that will materialize with success over the next few months and years. After listening to the words of the minister, we consider the uh, remote Communication is finished, and we move on to the next panel, which is the global overview of hydrogen in the world, opportunities and challenges. We're going to, to have um, a member of UGT uh, FICA, and we are 
really proud of that and she has uh, played a very important role in international trade unionism. Diana Junquera, who's the Director of Strategic Industry and Fair Transition of Industrial from Global Union. Please come to the stage. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. I mean, I feel like Madonna, and it is true that this um, light is uh, really bright and a bit intimidating. Thank you, UGT, for organizing this conference, for, because I think for the first time as a trade union, we are ahead of the game, and we are proactive, organizing something that has to do with the future, with what's to come and that we all feel part of as a trade union in industrial. I come as the director of energy for industrial global union. For those of you who don't know it, this is a global union. We are headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, and we represent over 50 million workers from all the industrial sectors of energy, mining, and manufacturing. We have 600 members in the world. One of them is FICA UGT. And our uh, General Secretary is Ario Haya, who couldn't be here with us today, but sent us his warmest regards. I would like to put the PowerPoint on, please, if I can. Perfect. I thought I was going to have the presentation in front of me, so every now and again I'll turn. I'm really sorry to see where we are. Perfect. But I, I don't like sitting down either, so you see, I'll just do it like this. They've told me to do a presentation about the overview of uh, hydrogen and what's happening in the different countries of the world and what are the experiences. And over the next two days, we're going to hear about trade union experiences and company experiences. But today, I would like to talk to you about the, the situation and the position of hydrogen all over the globe. We are going to focus more on green hydrogen which is what's going to be developed in Spain. It's made up of renewable energies. It's produced with renewable energies. But we're also going to hear about other types of hydrogen, like blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen, brown, pink. And each of them is defined depending on the type of production and how it is produced and the amount of emissions it uh, creates. So we are going to hear uh, mainly about blue hydrogen, which is the one produced from fossil fuels, but is where we capture the emissions. And we're also going to hear about the grey hydrogen, which is the one that's uh, produced from fossil fuels, like natural gas, but it's not captured. In industry all, we are working and we are trying to see exactly what's going to happen with hydrogen especially from a labor perspective. What we did was compare the value chain, and we've heard this before from the regional minister, also the Spanish minister has mentioned it, that we've talked about the chain, the value chain for oil, gas, and hydrogen, what it involves and the different parts it has. So we've made a comparison in order to see how we're going to go from one to the next and where those job positions that we are aiming to have will be. Now we have quite a few slides that I've uh, obtained from a report by the International Renewable Energies Agency. They've created what is called the hydrogen geopolicy. It's very interesting. I entice you to look at it. The slides will be in English, but there's nothing I could do about it. So I'm just going to tell you what they say. Here they talk about the priorities in terms of a policy that we're giving to green hydrogen and where we're investing more depending on uh, the maturity of the different projects. As you can see, where we're investing the most is in chemical and uh, refineries. Those are the easier projects to adapt to hydrogen. Also, steel, 
on um, C or um, ship in. Also, it will be uh, for air transport and for storage. Here you can see in the globe the importers or the countries that import, which are the ones in yellow, and the exporters, the countries or areas that export, that have a white circle. As you can see, there are two regions that are clearly importers, Europe and Asia, especially in China, Taiwan, and Japan, and Europe, as well as the US. And the remainders are exporters. But what's important is to see the circles around them, the circles that have been also cut off, because that's the possibilities. They shows the possibilities of developing more and more networks and agreements in terms of hydrogen in order to expand these networks. Here you can see the countries that currently, or oh, by October 2021, had designed already a hydrogen strategy as a country. Basically, they want to work on it, they want to invest on it, and then have decided to create a strategy with certain deadlines. And here, this is very interesting, even though it's a bit difficult to see because of the color of the circles, but the circles are smaller and darker nearly black, are the large-scale projects, industrial large-scale projects that are being carried out with hydrogen and for uh, turning into ammonium, methanol, uh, steel, and uh, for the supplying to the industry or for the refining of all those. And then we have others on transport. In yellow, we have integrated projects for hydrogen to give supply to different sectors, and this is something that we spoke about this morning, and also infrastructure projects. And the large dots in blue, in the lighter blue, those are large-scale projects that are being developed, currently 43 across the globe. And these slides, I think, is very interesting because these are, this is a list of the countries that are currently producing hydrogen and that are exporting it to other countries that are already using it for their industries. And here in the countries that are using it, we can see Belgium, Germany, Japan, the Netherlands, and the Republic of Korea. But what's Interesting about this is that the countries that are producing the hydrogen, which in the past were not large energy producers or oil producers at all, such as, for instance, Namibia was under the radar, or Tunisia, Brunei, the Iceland. And now we can see that they are placing themselves in the map and that they are going to be key players. This slide is about the largest hydrogen, green hydrogen projects that we have currently in the globe. And I think we can proudly say, well, this information has also been collected from the International Agency on Renewable Energies. And we can be proud to say that the first and most and largest project is in Spain. And this is a project that brings together over 30 companies that have uh, come together to create a large hydrogen hub, amongst them Fertiberia from chemicals and uh, fertilizers, Ena gas. There are many large and medium-sized companies that are participating in this project. And there will be a um, key hub for the industry and to provide hydrogen to other sectors. But we've also mentioned this morning, and we saw it this morning, and the minister also said it, in her speech, how we should value, how we should assess the value chain. It's very important to know where it comes from, how we produce the hydrogen, what materials are used, and where do we get all of this. If we look at the slide 
for mining, we can see the, ma the minerals needed to produce all of this. And most of them come from China, as you'll be able to see. But then secondly, we have South Africa and Congo. So we have to bear in mind that all of this, not all of this can be done here. There is a value chain that goes beyond our borders. There are many workers, many companies involved in all of this, and we need to be aware of what this involves when we talk about workers and the labor force. And in this slide, with the flags and the years, what it does is tells us where we expect hydro green hydrogen to be cheapest. So the renewable hydrogen versus blue hydrogen, depending on the years. And when will they manage to have the green hydrogen uh, be, become cheaper than blue hydrogen? So in Spain, we suspect by 2026, the green hydrogen will be cheaper to produce than the hydrogen we are currently producing with gas. And this is just a summary of the countries that potentially could be key hubs of hydrogen and that could be key players in the future. As you can imagine, China is the world leader right now, but it's a leader in the production of gray hydrogen. Gray hydrogen, that as we saw at the beginning, is the hydrogen that comes from coal and that is not captured. I mean, it continues to emit gases to the atmosphere. So basically, it's not worthwhile if we are trying to reduce emissions. But currently, they have 30 projects to produce renewable hydrogen, and they still do not have a national strategy. The United States is the second largest producer and consumer of hydrogen. 13% of the global demand is in the United States. Most of it is in California. They are leader, leaders in this topic, and they are doing it thanks to the subsidies and financing and programs that they have for electric vehicles. We have here colleagues from the US that also today will be giving us more information about all of this. India. India is also in the list, not because they're doing anything yet in terms of hydrogen, but because they have done a first, an announcement. Uh, Modi, the Prime Minister, has made an announcement and said that hydrogen will be key to decarbonize the industry and to uh, stop being uh, dependable on fossil fuels. But that's only an announcement. We'll have to see exactly where this leads them to. Japan, tomorrow we'll have our colleagues from the Japanese Trade Union, and they will be talking to us about how they use hydrogen uh, from a country perspective, but also in terms of mobility. Japan was the first country in the world in adopting a national strategy for hydrogen in 2017, and what they wanted was to become their hydrogen society. Tomorrow we'll have more information about that. But this is an interesting case because they do not produce hydrogen. They only import it. Where do they bring it from? From the Middle East and from Australia, basically. This afternoon, we'll have also a colleague from Australia who's going to talk to us about those links and connections that they have. And um, they have set themselves a goal for 2030, which is to have 800,000 uh, electric vehicles and 900 hydrogen stations, equivalent to gas stations. And another country also in Asia is South, South Korea. They created their national plan in 2019, and in 2021, they approved the law, the first law that champions and um, promotes hydrogen. It promotes a hydrogen from an economic perspective, but also in terms of safety or security. They want a lot of hydrogen, they want many electric vehicles with, uh, run with hydrogen. They want a lot of uh, hydrogen stations, but they also want hydrogen safety, and this is something which is very important. And the goal for 2025 20, is to have 200,000 electric vehicles. The European Union, well, the European Union is one of the 
big consumers of hydrogen and in already in using hydrogen in their industry. And it, it finds hydrogen to be a key technology in order to achieve their goals for the European Green Pact. And then there are other countries, the Green Deal, sorry. And there are other countries that is interesting because we do not have them in the radar as energy producers, like I said before. But they are, we have countries that always imported, have always imported energy such as Chile, Morocco, and Namibia, and now they are growing as producers of green hydrogen. However, there are other countries that we've always considered to be exporters of fossil fuels, oil and gas, such as Australia, Oman, uh, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, and they are now investing in green hydrogen to diversify their markets and uh, not to just uh, stay stuck in the fossil fuels. And here I have some examples of companies that are investing to use hydrogen in other sectors that are not um, energy, uh, but also to use it for other things. For instance, there are many, many other companies. I've chosen just a few examples. The first one is Saab, which is the Swedish um, metal industry, and they decided to start decarbonizing the steel industry. They created a company, a joint venture with LK, LCAP, LKAB, which is a mining uh, company, and Vattenfall, which is an energy company, and their goal was to replace coking coal that emits uh, a lot of emissions, <laughs> to replace it with renewable hydrogen. Not only are they managed to achieve that, and they're using it not just to produce steel, but they're also selling it to third parties, such as, for instance, Volvo. They're already selling it to Volvo, and Volvo is already using it in its um, lorries. For instance, here, in the central part of the lorry is where they're using it, in the rails of the chassis, we could say, and everything is then supported where where the whole structure of the lorry is then supported on. And the more steel uh, we have coming from renewable energies, well, the more s green steel, if we could call it like that, they will be using in the different parts of the lorry. There are two other companies that are investing in this, ArcelorMittal and the Thyssen Group. Uh, Thyssen Group. ArcelorMittal has just uh, proved less than a month ago they tested in their factory in Quebec, in Canada, they did a test, a 24-hour test, where in which they replaced 7% of the natural gas that they normally use for the process of steel making. They, they use hydrogen instead, instead of natural gas. And they saw that the result was satisfactory, so now they're going to try testing this but a large scale. They tested it only for 24 hours so far. And the last example I have is from ThyssenKrupp, which is a German company, and the same. They have created an agreement with STAG, which is a company that's going to supply to them green hydrogen. And by 2025, they will start operating the first plant out of the four plants that they will be using hydrogen for. In this case, what they're going to do or to replace is the... Uh, root of those uh, blast furnaces that were based on coal, and now they're going to use hydrogen instead. And then, well, the name of the talk was Opportunities and Challenges, which is what uh, we wanted to talk about and discuss. And um, the first institutional presentations, they've spoken a lot about the large opportunities that we will have and what this can bring with it and generate. Clearly, one of the great opportunities that we have is the potential that we have in terms of renewable energies for the renewable energy production. So here you can see on the map on the left uh, the amount of sun rays, uh, the irradiation that we have a per annual average horizontal uh, radiation uh, to re that solar panels can receive. And on the right we have the average wind speed 
uh, at 100 meters, which is where they at 100 meters height, which is where the um, turbine generators are. So this can give us an idea of where the production may go to, uh, as well as the production of green hydrogen. Here we have uh, this, you know, the potential to produce this green hydrogen, but it has to be. Uh, financially sustainable. We've also sp heard about cost reduction. By being financially sustainable, it means it has to be below $1.5 per kilogram of hydrogen. It's low, but if we want it to be competitive, it has to be. A, it has to have a low price. But that is for 2050. I mean, we still have a long time uh, to make this competitive. But as you can see, the huge potential of all of this is mainly in Africa, especially also in the Middle East in the st in uh, America as a whole and in Oceania. And this is a map of gas pipelines uh, that already exist and where we have the natural gas flowing through. And as we heard before, all this infrastructures, the infrastructures that we currently have will be used for hydrogen. We'll have to build more infrastructures, obviously, but we can reuse the current networks that we have, and this is a great opportunity that will make it easier for us to develop this technology. And here uh, we have the possibilities that exist in order to establish routes through Africa, because as you've seen, it's one of the greatest potential for the uh, generation of uh, renewable energy and green hydrogen, and these are the possible routes that we can generate in order to transport this hydrogen. But of course, we also have challenges ahead of us, many challenges ahead of us, in fact. The first one of them, I've already spoken about it, it has to do with the value chain and concentrating in other types of energies. Hydrogen is fine, but we must not forget that as a single energy on its own is not going to be able to replace what we have right now. We need a good energy mix, so we cannot forget about other energies that can be used, and we must not forget about the supply chain that this entail. Another challenge is that this is not a one-size-fits-all uh, thing. The, every one of us need to take a look at our own, circ our own circumstances, the country where we are, the different uh, policies that we have in our country, the energy mix that we have, and we'll have to see how can we develop the new industry. And as I said before, also reducing production cost. It's not easy, but if we all push uh, above all governments so that they give us a hand and they provide subsidies is going to be easy to reduce production costs so we can use uh, hydrogen faster. But let's not forget that we are members of a trade union. Hydrogen, technology, energy, all of these things sounds really good, but we are here to talk about the workers. And the most important challenge is to do a fair transition. And by fair transition, and this is something that we've heard about for many, many years, but we all have our own concept of what a fair transition is. We're all talking about this, but we're not very clear of what it means because it means something different for each one of them. And fair transition is not what the companies tell us that they're doing unilaterally. That's energy transition. That's what they're doing, and we're happy when they do energy transition. But fair transition is when they take us into consideration where trade unions participate from the very beginning till the very end, and when they participate in the negotiation, when they tell us what the plan is going to be, how is it going to be implemented, what future jobs are we going to have. Because when we talk about green jobs, green is not equivalent to good. It can be green in that sense it's good for the environment, but maybe it's not good or fair for the worker. So it's very important for these works, these jobs to come with guarantees, with social protection, with safe and healthy conditions that are guaranteed, that are the basic ones that cannot be less to what we have today. 
we cannot upset anything that's worse compared to what we have today. So it's very important for us to know when these jobs are going to be created. Are they already created? Are they being created? Are they going to replace uh, the jobs that exist today or are they going to be new? How are they going to train us for those jobs? How training is going to be? And these are questions that we ask ourselves nowadays. It's not easy to get answers, but that's why we have created this seminar. That's why we are participating here. And these are the questions that I put on the table so that maybe we can tackle them over the course of the next two days. And during all of our presentations, maybe we hear some answers. So that's all that I had to say. Thank you very much. I don't want to keep on talking about the fur transition because this is a very hot topic. But I want to thank you all for your attention. Hopefully, we can have a very fruitful debate. I'm truly happy to be here and see so many friends and colleagues. Me siento. Bien. Bien. Muchas gracias, Diana. Yo creo que has hecho una Thank you very much. I think you've done a wonderful uh, presentation of the situation. We're very good in terms of the time, so we have the time to uh, answer questions. Any questions for the speaker? I think they're fully convinced. Please take turns, take turns. If you could give a microphone to the person who raised his hand over there so that person can ask a question. We have a couple of microphones around, and we need those microphones, especially for the interpretation. Porque si no, no te, no te oímos y difícilmente te escucharemos. Si tenemos claro. los micros. Sí, por la traducción, sobre todo. Sí, por eso. Nos debiera aparecer el micro porque si no, no pueden traducir a los compañeros del exterior. We should be having a microphone, otherwise they can uh, provide a translation. Hola, buenas tardes. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Aitor Aizia and I represent Petronor. We spoke this morning, you gave us a very good presentation, but I would like to, I don't know if to ask a question or to make a comment, because this is relevant for all of us, and we all need to push forward so that at the end, in Europe, in the future, we have a very strong industrial sector with a lot of added value, with good jobs, so we have a prosperous and inclusive society. But it is true that in order to develop this type of industry, Technology, well, neither the technology nor the corporations are the only things that matter. There is a very important thing that depends on regulation and on governments and the EU Commission and the EU Parliament uh, sending out the right signals so that we can end up developing solutions so for which in Europe we have a competitive advantage. Uh, for example, in the sphere of the production of green hydrogen and sustainable fuels in Spain, we have good basis so we can become a very important actor for the future. So this is kind of like an open question. How do you think that we can reinforce these messages so that the regulators will understand it and will set up the necessary incentive framework so these type of industries develop here in Europe, here as in Europe. This is what you said this morning. Yeah, I understand. Well, I think this is a job that has to be done by all of us, but above all, They have to support the value chains. This is what you mentioned earlier. It cannot 
continue on having that we're bringing the materials from China because it's cheaper. No, 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 I'm sorry, but we need to uh, bring all of these industrial feedstock uh, from other countries in order to create more value. I don't know if you said it this morning or it was someone else saying it this morning. Here in Spain, we're not limited to uh, sunshine in and that's all. No, we want to be sunshine, and we want people to come here because of our sunshine, but we want to uh, have people here because of our industry. And we need for them to understand that they need to support this because that's the future. So companies are the ones that can push Because if they want Europe to have a future, they are the ones who have to roll with us so that companies will stay here and will not leave. Otherwise, the industry and the technology will end up leaving and professionals will also go to better places. More questions? Thank you. Hello, Diana, and thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. I just wanted to say, because maybe you know about this more than anyone else, because we keep on hearing uh, when talking about the automobile industry, we are hearing about the manufacturing of uh, buses and trucks that are going to run on hydrogen and maybe vehicles that wear cars, the regular cars. Do we have any dates so we can talk about having vehicles fueled by hydrogen? You mean here in Spain or at European level? I, I don't know. I cannot tell you. I don't know if uh, they're considering any possible date because I think our uh, level of production of green hydrogen has to be greater than the one that we have now because we don't want to import as we do with fossil fuels. We want to have all this hydrogen being produced here in order to generate this industry. And I don't think the industry is not so develop as to start using it in cars. But tomorrow we'll see what happens in Japan and in Germany and how they're using green hydrogen for mobility purposes and maybe they can give us a clue. I don't know if anyone else here can give you an answer, but I don't have that information. More questions? No, boys. Uh, well, if not, thank you very much, Diana, for your wonderful presentation. I think we're doing uh, really good in terms of uh, the time. So we're going to initiate the third panel that it is called Hydrogen from Different Perspective. It's going to be moderated by our colleague Gustavo Vargas, who is the Sectorial Secretariat of Energy and Water from UGT FICA. So I ask Sari Sairanen from Uniform Canada, SAC, Dan Calfe from Australian Workers Union and Corey Channon from the inter well from the Climate Change Policy Solutions Boiler Markers International and uh, our moderator to come up on stage.
la escucha, se me oye. No. Racha Aldeón, Good evening y buenas tardes a todas y todos. Good evening everyone. We're waiting for our colleague to come. He's getting his microphone so we can uh, begin. And uh, we're going to be talking uh, about an issue that it is essential for UGT FICA, uh, which is the one of uh, green hydrogen. And as the culmination of a process that is started in uh, February 2019, where the Ministry of Energy and Environmental Transition uh, consider that energy transition. Well, we now have a climate change and uh, environmental transition legislation as the product of these um, debates. So we can build a more sustainable world and a more sustainable economy. So when you think about a more sustainable uh, world, we have many doubts as to how far can we go and if we want to do it and how we want to do things. I heard our colleague Diana uh, saying before that we need to know what process are we going to do if we want to do a fair transition. The economic and environmental transition will be done for sure, but will it be done taking into consideration the workers so that no one is left behind? Uh, in not only um, workers, but the regions and the areas where these industries are located. Are these regions going to be left behind as well? For us, hydrogen will play a key role in the future. It will be a priority. Now, it means less than 1% of the energy produced but we know that in the coming 20 years, we're foreseeing an increase of the demand, an exponential increase of the demand. And in our organization, in our federation, and in our sector, we are hoping to be able to talk about this transition from this very moment. And the best way of proceeding with this debate is to see what's happening in other uh, places, uh, listening from different perspectives. We'll hear uh, from Sari from Uniform in Canada, SAC from um, the United States and CORE in, in uh, SAC from Australian Workers Union in, and we will get their own perspective. So without further ado, I would like to hear uh, what uh, Sari uh, has to say from Unifor Canada. Thank you. Hi everyone, can you hear me? I'm gonna go and get the clicker so you can watch me as I walk across the stage. Take my clicker. And I'm so glad to see so many of you sitting in the front row. I spoke last week at another conference. Everyone was at the back of the room. There was nobody at the front. And I'm wearing my bifocal so I can make eye contact with people in the front row. So I hope you're, you're feeling that I'm speaking to you. So here we go. Okay. That's not my presentation. That is the wrong presentation that was loaded. This is something else that I did, but I don't want, think you want to see about a climate task force. It was a presentation on my, my stick that said Bill Bao. So as they get that sorted out, let me fill in. My name is Sari Saarinen. I'm the National Health and Safety Environment Director for Unifor. And Unifor is Canada's largest private sector union. We have approximately 315,000 workers right across Canada from coast to coast to coast. And that's a large country. There are mm, four and a half time zones in Canada, probably similar to what uh, uh, Zach has to do and Corey as well in the United States. So traveling from one end of the country to the next is, is quite a feat. And I'm just seeing where, okay, well, you'll have to, we'll have to do a team effort here. Uh, we'll have Zach go next, and then we'll get my organized. 
team effort here. Sorry, I'm going to have to exit the stage. Pues sí, eh, de mientras que lo conseguimos, vamos a dar la palabra a Sac. Well, maybe we can give the floor to Sac. Uh... Um, I apologize to the translators in advance for my accent. I'm sure it's not easy to translate, so thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to thank you for inviting me uh, to this beautiful part of the world. Uh, also, to um, it's a privilege to speak at this conference uh, amongst uh, a number of very well-regarded uh, individuals in the trade union movement uh, worldwide. Uh, and I'm th I would also like to thank everyone for a warm welcome to the country. Um, my name is Zach Duncalf. I'm the National Legal Officer for the Australian Workers' Union. I'm also a national organiser in oil and gas. And uh, I also chair the uh, AWU National Hydrogen Committee, which is obviously another link to why I'm here. Um, this afternoon, I'll take you through a brief overview uh, of uh, what presence and future green hydrogen has in Australia. So the Australian Workers' Union, uh, we're a broad, general, blue-collar uh, union with expansive coverage of dozens of industries. Uh, we cover the oil and gas industry, the steel and aluminium industries, metalliferous mining, uh, such as iron ore, precious metals, and rare earths. Uh, we cover the manufacture and storage of chemicals, civil construction, manufacturing, and then also hydrocarbons generally. Uh, the constitutional coverage of the Australian Workers' Union covers most aspects of hydrogen production, uh, transmission, and also storage, particularly the chemical storage. And the AWU will also cover the construction of the facilities and also some of the components, such as electrolyzers, uh, of the hydrogen uh, industry. Uh, it's easy to see why, as a union, we are interested in the development of the hydrogen industry in Australia. Uh, and currently, the union's focus is on jobs, including what types of jobs there will be in the future hydrogen sector, how many will be created, the training requirements for those jobs, and also the likely energy transition and how it will be uh, performed. So Australia and hydrocarbons, talking about the transition. Uh, the AWU has thousands of members engaged in the oil and gas industry, and that's particularly in the liquid natural gas export industry. Australia is the biggest exporter of uh, liquid natural gas in the world, uh, 80 million tonnes in 2021. And this is reflected in the employee numbers in the industry. So we have uh, over 26,000 workers in the upstream part of the industry and just shy of 13,000 in the midstream. So jobs in the uh, hydrocarbon sector, particularly uh, the upstream, they're generally well paid. And uh, of those, particularly the directly employed workers in production. However, there's a high level of casualisation in the industry, and that's due to aggressive contracting and undercutting that has emerged over the past decade, and this has eroded the job security of many people in the sector. Although Australia produces incredible amounts of LNG, uh, there's no reservation policy for that gas, um, federally, that is, and in many circumstances, domestic purchases uh, pay more for Australian gas than foreign purchases do. Um, should a hydrogen and export industry be established in Australia, and that is the intention, uh, we would be pushing very, very hard to learn from our mistakes in the LNG industry and establish a hydrogen reservation policy uh, so that domestic users have access to the hydrogen produced in Australia. Uh, the consequences of Australia not having a national gas reservation policy are currently being felt in the global energy crisis. Uh, one state in Australia, Western Australia, uh, does have a reservation policy for its gas, and currently the spot price uh, in that state is $5.50 per gigajoule. All the other states, there's no reservation policy, and they're looking at $40 to $44 uh, per gigajoule. So we'd want to learn from this experience 
Um, we've been, as a union, we've been pushing gas reservation for a very, very long time, and it seems that now, in the current crisis, with a newly um, elected Labor government, we will get some movement on that. But should a hydrogen industry be established, that should be one of the first things out the gate. For a producing country, we need to reserve the hydrogen for our use as well as export it for other countries to use. So the relationship between unions and, and employers in Australia, uh, particularly the large energy producers, it's generally not that collaborative, uh, at least not by default. Um, in organising the hydrocarbon sector, the AWU has generally been met with hostility from employers that try any method available to lock the union out or undermine the union's presence, and I don't think that is a unique experience. Relationships between unions and employers can become collaborative, uh, and we seek them to be, uh, but this can take many years to build, and there needs to be a catalyst, and generally that catalyst is uh, mutual respect that develops after hard-fought negotiations or an existential threat to the actual sector, such as the steel mill industry in Australia, and that's caused by uh, energy and the cost of energy in Australia. So on to hydrogen in Australia. So the Australian Federal Government and every state government in Australia, they all have hydrogen strategies. They've all published them. Uh, and these look at the industry's growth and utility in the country. Most of the hydrogen strategy documents focus on the development of green hydrogen products, um, projects, sorry, uh, and apparently that's to the exclusion of all other types of hydrogen at this stage. Uh, the federal government, our national government, uh, the hydrogen strategy there appears to embrace both green and blue, uh, but no grey. The Australian Federal Government has announced recently that it will invest uh, just over one billion US dollars in the creation of an Australian hydrogen export industry, and there's been a number of grants already awarded out of that. The general consensus is that Australia is well placed to become a large-scale hydrogen exporter, and this is based on a number of key elements, and Diana pointed to at least one of those before. We have an abundance of land uh, for solar and wind infrastructure, our population density is only 3.3 people per square kilometre. Uh, we have very high solar exposure. Uh, the majority of the land mass gets a daily solar exposure of between 22 to 24 megajoules per metre squared. Uh, we have brown coal deposits. Uh, we have experience with a large-scale energy export, uh, LNG. And our geographic location for the Asian markets is also quite good. So the, the Australian government does wish for Australia to develop a hydrogen export industry in the likeness of the current LNG industry. There's currently a huge flurry of projects being announced all over Australia, uh, well over 100 uh, in fact, uh, but the reality is that only one project in Australia is currently producing hydrogen in export quantities, and that's the hydrogen energy supply chain project in Victoria, and that's currently a grey hydrogen project with a view to transitioning to blue. Uh, there are some small-scale green hydrogen projects that are operational in Australia. However, most of these are pilots and proof of concept, and I'll talk about those shortly. The Australia has a renewable energy agency, and it's re recently announced $103 million in funding shared between three commercial-scale green hydrogen projects each of those uh, with a 10 megawatt gas, um, 10 megawatt electrolyzer, sorry. Uh, two of those will be for gas blending and another one for hydrogen expansion at an ammonia facility. So there's been some massive announcements in Australia about green hydrogen energy projects, um, but unfortunately we're unlikely to see any real movement on them soon. Uh, the Western Green Energy Hub, it's a 15,000 square kilometre complex planned with 50 gigawatt solar and wind, and they're looking at a final investment decision in 2025, so we're still a way off on that. Uh, the Asian Renewable Energy Hub is a 26 gigawatt solar and wind, but we're even further away with a final uh, investment decision in 2028. H2 Hub in Gladstone is going to be a $1.6 billion industrial complex with a 3 gigawatt electrolyzer, uh, and that's currently in the feasibility stage, uh, so we're still a few years off on that. And finally, the Desert Bloom Green Hydrogen Project will be 10 gigawatts, uh, and that's a project using air-to-water technology, so it doesn't need 
a ground base of water to produce hydrogen. Of the operational green hydrogen energy uh, projects in Australia, there's the Western Sydney Green Gas Facility, and that's an operational pilot that produces green hydrogen uh, for 2% blending into existing natural gas supply. Hydrogen Park SA is a similar project, but that's for 5% hydrogen blend into existing natural gas supply. And there's also one hydrogen refueling facility in Australia that's used for a government vehicle fleet. So I referred to the Desert Bloom Green Hydrogen Project previously, and I'll just take some time to go through this uh, proposal. As of yet, there's been no uh, building, or this is not operational or constructed just yet, but it is close to becoming so. So it's a joint project between Osaka Gasco and a company called Aqua Irum. The project aims to produce over 400,000 tonnes of green hydrogen per year. And it's a, it's a modular design. So each modular is called a hydrogen production unit and they're completely self-contained. They each have an electrolyzer um, and a um, solar panel and also the process for drawing water from air. So the project intends to utilise technology that draws water from air rather than using a ground-based uh, water source for the electrolyzer. So each HPU will have its own solar system, water producing unit, solar heater and electrolyzer and it will be developed in stages which is obviously facilitated by the modular design. Um, this is obviously likely to reduce the number of jobs during construction, the modular design. Um, the project intends to reach commercial production of green hydrogen by mid-2023 and the project backers hope that they'll be able to get green hydrogen at a commercial scale for export um, at less than $2 a kilo by 2027. So hydrogen and jobs, which is obviously a key feature for unions uh, looking at hydrogen and the transition to it as an energy source. It's, it's a great renewable, alternative renewable energy source that has many applications and uh, particularly for applications beyond domestic electricity supply such as transport and feedstock in heavy industry. The hydrogen industry, particularly the large scale export projects, present an opportunity for fossil fuels workers uh, to transition into renewable energy production. However, unfortunately, estimates appear to suggest that the hydrogen production industry will create less jobs than it will potentially displace in time. Like most energy infrastructure projects, jobs will peak in construction. However, estimates suggest that the gap between construction jobs and operational jobs will be far wider with hydrogen production than it is with gas and oil. Using Desert Bloom and Western Sydney Green Gas as examples, the modular construction, potential remote operation and low maintenance of these facilities doesn't lend these projects towards large workforces, which is unlike offshore LNG facilities, for example. Job estimates for Desert Bloom are up to 1,000 during construction and then up to 120 ongoing jobs once the project is completed. Uh, however, construction jobs estimates are probably a little loose on this as the project will be developed in stages so it's hard to imagine that 1,000 jobs will be created over the life of the project. For the initial stage, the Desert Bloom project claims it will create 100 construction jobs and six ongoing operations roles. Renewable energy makes up about 7% of the energy mix in Australia with wind, solar and hydro generating approximately 50% of that 7%. Although, although solar and wind farms are being built and some large ones do exist in Australia, these are mainly used to provide power to the grid for domestic use. For the green hydrogen production sector in Australia to thrive, a built for purpose infrastructure such as solar, wind and hydro will need to be undertaken in Australia. To get the industry producing at an export level will take a significant amount of time. Of course, there's a huge opportunity for Australia, uh, Australian manufacturing sector uh, for this infrastructure, including the electrolyzers and all the components, wind turbines, we make our own steel, we mine our own ore, and we have our own heavy, um, uh, heavy manufacturing. However, offshoring of those jobs is typical, 
Uh, and so we would like to take advantage of that sector as well by keeping those jobs local. It is likely the expansion in grey and blue hydrogen production uh, using brown coal and gas as feedstock will occur in Australia until green hydrogen can be produced at scale at a competitive price. Although the long-term future of what part hydrogen will play in Australia's future energy production and what size the industry will grow depends on a number of factors, it is clear that Australia wants to establish an export scale green hydrogen sector and become one of the largest hydrogen producers in the world. Governments at all levels have shown a keen interest in the sector's development and businesses including energy and mining giants have announced countless hydrogen projects all over the country. The AWU looks forward to Australia establishing a world leading green hydrogen export industry but we acknowledge the barriers to get to that point and the union's desire to protect its members interests including job quality job security and for a just transition that leaves no one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zach. And now we give the floor once again to Sari. And let's hope that it's all working properly now. The floor is yours. Keep pressing the button. Ready. I'm ready. <laughs> and my slides are ready as well. So thank you, everyone. Um, it's nice to be back. Um, yes. Uh, thank you for the technical assistance behind me. They worked really hard to get my slides done. So um, thank you very much for the organizers of this conference. We're very pleased to be here. I'm here with my colleague Simon Legbing from our Montreal office, uh, who's done a lot of heavy lifting for these, uh, for these slides, for this presentation. So as I started earlier, um, we are Canada's largest private sector union. We represent about 315,000 members across Canada. The bulk of those members are in Ontario, the province of Ontario. Um, that's where I live and that's where our nat national office is as well in Toronto. And there is about um, 696 local unions and uh, nearly 3,000 collective agreements. So that means we're in bargaining all the time. There's someone bargaining every single uh, week of the year. And this is also a good breakdown of the sectors that we represent. And you see in the, in the green where the uh, resources, the forestry, the energy sector is, as well as where we have manufacturing. And we also have services. Um, services would be anywhere from um, hospitality, would be um, any of these kind of people-facing services as well as communications. We, uh, we have members who work in media, who work in uh, telecommunications. So during the last two years of a pandemic, as people worked from home, our members were in demand. And of course, transportation, whether it's uh, road transportation going across the country or going even into the United States, but also air. I come out of the aviation sector. And of course, rail and then uh, marine. All of these sectors require energy. None of them are excluded from energy. Some of them utilize a lot of energy. There is a lot of um, heavy emissions as well from some of the manufacturing as well as some of the uh, energy sectors, whether it's a refinery or um, any of the other processing plants. So our interest um, in hydrogen um, is in these four questions. Is does hydrogen represent a solution to the energy transition challenge? How can our members take advantage of the development of hydrogen? What advantages does Canada offer for the creation of a hydrogen industry? Just as we heard from Australia, what are the future markets associated with the emergence of hydrogen in Canada? And we saw some of that in Deanna's presentation as well. And this is a, a great slide. This is from Natural Resources Canada. And they've really mapped out of how in each of the provinces, they're looking at harnessing uh, future energy sources as well as transitioning current sources into the future, whether it's hydrogen 
or some other modalities. So it's a really good roadmap, even for us to look at as we build our uh, future industrial vision of where are the opportunities, where are the conversations that need to take place with employers. Some of us have common employers. Uh, we have common employers with the US. We have common employers in Australia. So what is the vision for energy transition that is taking place? And so our efforts are really to understand the co scope of hydrogen role in decarbonizing industrial processes and transportation. There is a lot of talk about hydrogen, but it seems difficult sometimes to separate that fact from fiction, real life possibilities from imaginary ones. Its emergent and possibly disruptive nature in industry makes it a definite, definitive point of interest for unions like us. And so hydrogen in Canada um, is interesting when we start looking at that. And when we start looking at some of the top producers, as we saw, top producers of hydrogen in the world, 76% in uh, Western Canada, hydrogen production. Gray is king, and we heard what is gray hydrogen from Diana's uh, presentation, fossil fuels. We've got lots of fossil fuels in Canada and green produced for some time, but it's small scale in nature. How do we expand that? How do we ensure that there is the resources available as well as the infrastructure to help that? And the key is to have access to abundant and cheap renewables, whether it's hydro or natural gas. And Canada has a diverse background it's a large country, as you saw from that map that uh, Natural Resources Canada had put together, and we have a qualified workforce. We've, uh, we had some discussion at lunch hour today about how do you train, how do you ensure that your workforce is kept current as well as uh, any recurrent training and new training is offered to them by qualified providers, not fly-by-night operators that come in when they see the flavor of the month, but these are qualified trainers that provide that opportunity. And Canada has a hydrogen um, strategy and they have put it into eight pillars. And those pillars are enabling policies and regulations. We all need to have a roadmap of where do we go, who participates, and it's de-risking investments. So you need to have investors coming in, make sure that they see opportunities for themselves. Seeking strategic partnerships, and we saw that in uh, Diana's presentation, how important it is to have partnerships. Fostering research and innovation. How true is that? R&D is so important, and we're seeing that in many, uh, many of the uh, uh, players coming in and saying we're investing into R&D. But it's also strengthening those codes and standards to ensure that there is a level playing field, not only in that market sector, but for workers as well. We've heard that, that they have to be healthy, they have to be safe, they have to be good unionized jobs. And it's also raising that awareness within communities of what the possibilities are, demanding those possibilities. And it's having a regional blueprint. It's that intersection between promises, provinces. As you saw, Canada is a huge country, and there is also a, a very diverse climate. So we don't all enjoy the beauty and, and the mild climate that is in Western Canada, where Vancouver is, Whistler and mountains and skiing. When you come into the prairies, I spent some of my formative years in Winnipeg, Minus 40 degrees. Imagine what that feels like. And heating your homes, and in the summertime, as it gets hot here, minus four, or plus 45 to sometimes plus 47 when you have humidity taken into account. So you have that diversity of climates and energy needs as well, and then industry needs that go along with that. And of course, developing those international markets as we've seen from other presenters. But it's also about that transformative opportunity of having those discussions between the federal government as well as the federal jurisdiction. What are the needs? How do we develop this? 
what is the collaboration that needs to take place. And we are looking at um, uh, the petroleum sector. We have lots of our members who work in that sector. And uh, they're, they're looking at the heydays right now as the oil prices are going. And for us as an organization as well to start and continue those conversations about what is the future for fossil fuels. We need to prepare for that. It has to have started yesterday, not today. But they're like, ooh, what's really concern of us is automation. It's not climate change. We're still having some of those conversations. But it's also looking at that um, bullish protect, uh, projections that the Canadian government has put forward for 2050. And it's looking at um, having their uh, share of the energy supply um, 30%, looking at new jobs. These are all attractive things of having more than 350,000 jobs out there. And that means that uh, the changes in the environment and the changes in the energy composition, that will translate to um, a cleaner environment to the tune of taking five million cars off the roads. So five million cars, we also represent workers at General Motors, at Ford, at Stellantis, that was known as Fiat and Chrysler. And they're like, ooh, what does that mean for us? Well, we did very well in the 2020 auto bargaining, getting the employers to recognize that you can't just rely on internal combustion engines. You have to change your formula as well as the demands go. In the past, they weren't interested in that, but in recent years, they have seen the shift in consumer patterns as well. So we were able to negotiate many of our uh, assembly plants turning into electric vehicles. We had one of our plants recently at General Motors that closed on May 1st as it is being retrofitted to produce electric vehicles. And the assembly line will come online October of this year. And the vehicles will start rolling off the assembly line by November. That's a huge turnaround. But in the meantime, the workers are on layoff notice and we've got provisions in the collective agreement to look after them. But it's also the parts, independent parts plants. You don't need as many parts for an electric vehicle as you did for a uh, internal combustion engine. So there is that just transition that needs to take place in those conversations. And we as a, as a representative of those workers, we can't shy away from that. We have to have those honest conversation of what does just transition mean to you. And it's also looking at ensuring that there is that social dialogue. There is a national steering committee that has, to, that has also been um, uh, established and uniform is part of that conversation and on that steering committee. And so when you start looking at regionally, what are some of the opportunities and possibly some of the, uh, the issues that we also need to address. So there is uh, in British Columbia, which is on the west coast, that's where Whistler is, if you're a skier, Vancouver is. You have potential for green and blue hydrogen. There are leading developers and test bed for fuel cell produ products for transportation, whether it's long haul transportation, vehicle transportation, but there is interest for that. And some of the major automakers, of course, are working with these fuel cell industries, uh, investing heavily in R&D. There is a future there. And then once you start looking at Alberta, we have members who work in the oil sands in Fort McMurray in northern Alberta that have been there for generations um, working in the oil fields. And uh, this, is, this is the hard part, is looking at how do you transition from the uh, oil, uh, oil producing uh, uh, companies as well as ensuring that you have a future. And these are the workers that see their livelihood being diminished from automation. And we hear of automation as well, but it's also the vision that these employers are building. What's around the corner? What's around that mountain that I'm going to be able to participate in? Is it hydrogen production? Is it something else? Is it wind turbines that they're producing? 
or installing for their sources of energy. Social dialogue, we need to be part of those conversations. It shouldn't just be left to the market forces. There has to be government involvement to get those conversations going. So Alberta is also the largest producer of hydrogen, hydrogen carriers such as ammonia and methanol. Um, hydrogen is viewed as the key element of a net zero oil and gas future. And Alberta sees that. And of course there are many efforts into proofing carbon capture and we'll hear that from Corey, utilization and sequestration operations that are out there. And there's a big project. There is a Quest project, which is the biggest active sequestration operations that are taking place. So there's lots of activities that are happening. There's also a Polaris project that's coming 2023 of uh, um, looking at how to, um, to support blue hydrogen production. So Alberta, lots is happening there, that they're also not putting their eggs into one basket. Ontario, that's where I live, and that's where the largest base of our members are, very diverse industries in, in Ontario. And what they're looking at is a broad-based strategy of how to, to leverage the infrastructure that they have. There's some oil refinery in the south, near the American border where Detroit is. There's lots of, excuse me, lots of uh, um, oil refinery that happens there. They're looking at ways, nuclear energy. There's lots of nuclear energy. In Ontario, every second outlet that you plug in or you flip a switch for the light to come on comes from nuclear energy. And it's also uh, potentially exploring these creations of these hydrogen hubs into Ontario. It's really accelerating that um, low carbon um, output into, uh, into its energy mix. It's modernizing its uh, regulations to enable uh, carbon capture uh, sequestrations activities um, in Ontario. And it's really looking at how are they going to support heavy industry as well. Making sure that you have enough energy to propel the, uh, the, the manufacturing hub. There's a highway that goes across Ontario that's called the 401, and that is that uh, manufacturing hub. That goes across Ontario into the United States, and it's busy with transport trucks bringing parts into, uh, into Canada and vice versa parts um, going from Canada into US. Very integrated system. And how do you ensure, ensure that that industry hub is energized the best and the cheapest way possible? And Quebec. Quebec has lots going on. Uh, sometimes you look at Quebec and Canada as being sort of uh, visionary, thinking outside the box, having uh, different opportunities than the rest of uh, English Canada does have. So it is a leader in green hydrogen production. Um, electrolysis and biomass. There's a lot of advantages that they have there, that they have renewable electricity, they've got 90% hydro. Hydro dams are, are big in, uh, uh, in Quebec, as well as some wind energy, and how are you competitive? Uh, you know, if there's any surpluses, where do you sell it? But you also have to ensure that you look after your home fires when you're needing extra energy during the winter months. Winters can be harsh in Quebec as well as heat. They can be very hot in the summertime, so you need to have that extra energy to cool your systems as well. And uh, it's a, uh, they have a very reliable and uh, a robust distribution grid. That's so important. You can have big black outages, as you probably read in newspapers, that uh, they've uh, happened in the US. They've happened in Toronto as well. A number of years ago, there was a huge, a huge blackout because the energy grid just went down. They weren't able to sustain the, uh, the heat that was happening that summer, and the system just came down. And there have been, um, since I've been in Ontario, there have been some, or some occasions in the summertime when, yeah, there's power outages because the system has just been overloaded. So how is renewable energy going to be able to sustain and give you that power to sustain your, uh, your distribution? And you have to have that reliability, and Quebec has been able to build that and, uh, and maintain that over the years. 
And of course, you have to have diversification. So uh, looking at biomass distribution, using that as your source of energy and R&D. Can't say enough about uh, research and development collaborations between industrialists and researchers. It requires every stakeholder to be part of the solutions. No one can be on their own. They can't be an island on their own. We all have to pull in together and have those uh, conversations. And here are some examples that are happening in Quebec right now. Uh, in Bécancourt, Air Liquide, um, they have a 20 uh, megabyte or megawatt, megabyte, megawatt electrolyzer. It's among the biggest in the world. You've got uh, Enerchem in Varenne with their clean fuel project that is coming in um, online in 2023. Repsol is a stakeholder in that. There's other um, projects as well that are looking uh, to produce uh, 300 megawatts. I mean, that's, that's huge numbers. But there's a cautionary tale here as well. And it is that when you're producing renewable energies, you're using newer technologies or, or any transformations that are happening, is you also have to ensure that you're looking after your own um, uh, industrial base and not always looking at, well, is there going to be surplus and just worrying about the surplus. It is also looking after your own home fires and building the confidence in your citizens that you can make these transformation, that it is going to be seamless as possible and you're going to enjoy your modern quality of life that you have. And so our interest, as I said before, is it, it is about the fact and fiction. It's about the workforce transition. It's having those social dialogues with our employers and governments, whether it's federal or provincial governments and municipal governments about that workforce transition. And it's looking at what are those opportunities? How are those opportunities being mapped out? And if there are any limitations, how can we overcome those limitations? And as Zach said, it is about job security. It is about our members feeling secure in the future of energy and its transformation and making those, sure those jobs are safe, healthy, and, uh, and that they are good unionized jobs. Thanks very much. Muchísimas gracias, Sari. Thank you very much, Sari. Thank you for your presentation. And now we give the floor now to Corey Channon. Corey, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Um, greetings. Uh, on behalf of our international president, Newton B. Jones, I'd first like to extend fraternal greetings to UGT and FICA. And we really thank you uh, for this opportunity. And, uh, the other distinguished guests here. Um, hopefully we can share a little bit of information. My name is Corey Shannon. I'm the International Director for Climate Change Policy Solutions for the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers for North America. Um, I was asked to speak somewhat about the United States, but in my conversation I'll probably talk a little bit more and expand on some of the, uh, the realities and the challenges that uh, are, are faced with the development of the variety of different types of, of hydrogen production out there. Um, but I'd first like to start off and play a short little video, then I'll get into a few slides, and certainly I'll be available to answer any questions. And if, if you could please run that, that film, it would be much appreciated. Thank you. Carbon is part of everything that surrounds us today, from the cement industry to the oil and gas sector to steel manufacturing to plastics production. It all has to change. We have to capture that CO2. It's really frustrating for me because we've got a third of the world's oil in northeastern Alberta. And so we've got this great resource and the oil has a lot of carbon in it. So carbon is something that we have to manage effectively. But we have proven technology Carbon capture was a natural fit for us to reduce these emissions. So that's where CCS came from. The CO2 can be stored three kilometers underground. They're already doing this. It's safely done, it's safely stored. We're on the eve of an energy evolution. 
because this technology will also be needed and applied to the development of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most plentiful element on Earth and in the universe. When we burn hydrogen, the byproduct of hydrogen is water. It's clean. We could use it in cement. We can use it in steel. We can use it in electrical generation. It's going to be big for us. The next phase of the energy evolution will be to use natural gas as a feedstock to create hydrogen. We're stripping all these different gases off and we save that hydrogen and pressure vessels for when we need it. And it would work very similar to a battery, but we also have to apply carbon capture technology to capture that CO2. The economic benefits of building these facilities for modularization you massively reduce costs up to 50% by modularization. We're building these things in a controlled environment very close to where we would assemble them in the field. Modularization is going to impact the boilermakers in a positive way. We're already doing this in manufacturing with a high level skilled workforce and well paid jobs. That's where that world's going. Who's going to do that work? The Boilermakers are really well positioned. It's a natural fit for us to build these modules and apply this in the field. We're advocating for a technology that is going to provide well-paid, meaningful jobs and cleaning up the environment. If this is new, exciting stuff and it's making a difference to the environment, we're changing the world, there's a great land of opportunity in all this stuff. And this is why Boilermakers are part of this. We all care about the planet. We care about the environment. We have to be thinking forward and moving forward together. Thank you. Now you can run my short presentation. All right, great, thank you. Okay, who are these Boilermakers anyway, and what do we do? Well, we've been around since 1880. We started off in manufacturing and the railroad industry building steam locomotives. So we've always been involved with steam. We've been involved with steam, but we've also been involved with the transition of different types of transportation and, and, and of course, the production of the different fuel sources that have been needed in those different sectors. We work in pretty much every sector. We build uh, cement plants. We operate these cement plants. We're working in the oil and gas sector, uh, on, primarily on construction and the maintenance. It's the Unifor folks, our friends from Unifor in Canada in particular, who are the operations personnel, but they also have their skilled workers and mechanics and whatnot to keep these facilities operable. We work in the nuclear industry. We work and build and maintain Canada's naval fleet as well as the U.S. naval fleet. But what, why do we care? Well, the Boilermakers have been part of advocating for pollution control systems since the 1950s when we had coal-fired boilers and we had no pr uh, particulate control, so we were involved with installing precipitators, the electrostatic precipitators to keep dust and fly ash from going into the environment and, 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 and polluting rivers, streams, lakes, and everything else. So we are huge on these sort of things. And we were also involved with working with environmental groups when they would actually work with us and take sensible approaches to, to find solutions to these problems in, in, in applying flue gas desulfurization to reduce sulfur dioxide, which is another bad thing that we can't throw in the air. It only made sense for us to get involved and advocate for CCUS because why? That means good paying jobs, good paying union jobs, and it means cleaning the environment. That's that win-win story. Advocacy is incredibly important. When I first got into this role, 
of running around the world, living out of Air Canada and hotels, and finding out how really complex the energy industry is and how it's so important to keep this energy industry alive because it's keeping our economies moving forward and rolling along. It's important. Some of these slides here are some folks that I've had the privilege to meet and work with in my travels, and we've built quite a coalition to be able to advise the government, not just in Canada, but in the United States as well, because Canada does have a hydrogen policy, but in the United States, we're currently working with their government to develop a similar hydrogen policy. Advocacy and education are so, so important. There are solutions. There are all, there's many different solutions that are available there to mitigate climate change. And we believe in climate change, but we also believe in taking a sensible approach to mitigate climate change. That means that we support all the different pathways and all the different essential tools that the governing authority that we all think is the governing authority, the IPCC, we don't get to cherry pick. We don't get to cherry pick and think that this type of energy production or this type of energy production is going to do the world any good economically or environmentally. So it's important to adopt all these solutions. That means that CCUS and hydrogen need to be part of that solution. We're not going to meet the emission re reduction targets without these technologies. Again, it's an all of the above. People have said the Boilermakers are advocating for CCUS to extend the life of fossil fuels. Yes, we are, because fossil fuels, we need fossil fuels to manufacture renewable sources of energy today. And that's not going to change for at least a few decades. And when we get to talk about the different types of hydrogen, hydrogen is clean, regardless of how you produce it. But if we don't capture the emissions, that's where we create the problems. And it's not the industries that employ us that are the villains. The villain is CO2. But there's solutions to address that. We need to plant more trees. We need to build carbon capture to, to keep the oil and gas sector alive. We need to capture emissions. We need to apply wind, solar. We need to do all of these different things. We're not cherry picking from the IPCC and nor should anybody else. In fact, it would be irresponsible to do anything otherwise. Education. So when we create these short films and we run around the world talking about how we feel the energy sector is going to be moving forward, we also have to provide the sources. And that's why, again, if we're going to talk about the IPCC or even the IEA, these are the things that we have to do and we have to work together because right now we're not working together as closely as we should be and that has to change because time is running out. Governments around the world and the participants who signed on to the Paris Agreement were too busy fighting about what's going to be best for energy production rather than what's going to be best with that low-hanging fruit. And we have to look at what will work best regionally because what might work well in Europe or in the UK might not necessarily work what's best in Canada or in the United States or any other country. So when we get into the different types of hydrogen and we're talking about green hydrogen, green hydrogen has a ways to go. In fact, we have a few decades to go before we really get into commercialization for that, that type of a technology because you cannot operate an electrolyzer on on renewable energy alone, because renewable energy from wind and solar is intermittent. And in fact, the efficiencies of those technologies, which are very important, but they need to be applied in different regions where that technology is going to work best. This is why we have to look at all the different types of hydrogen production and how we're going to collect emissions, because this is what we have to do. Green hydrogen is three to four times more expensive than than the development of blue hydrogen. But blue hydrogen, you have to capture that CO2. But you can produce hydrogen through gasification, and you could produce hydrogen through small modular, uh, not small modular reformers, but small methane reformers, my apologies. Even that technology is becoming redundant. 
because there are auto thermal reforming technologies now that are available and modularization is gonna play a pivotal role because again, there's incredible cost savings when you can have these things manufactured and simply shipped out into the field and bolted up. Do these really work? These are just some examples of, we're, we're reading a lot about this right now around the world about different types of direct air capture and do they work? They do work, but they're not economically feasible right now. So they're using different uh, employer groups like Microsoft and, and all kinds of, even energy firms by offset emissions and that's how they're able to fund some of these uh, programs through direct air capture, DAC. Some of these pictures here, so we have three developers right now globally for direct air capture. We've got Climeworks in Switzerland, Global Thermostat in the United States, and we have Carbon Engineering in the west coast of Canada in Squamish, uh, British Columbia. They work, but again, they have a long ways to go because it's very expensive to capture and very difficult to capture CO2 from atmospheric air because the concentrations are very, very low and it's very expensive. It's between $600 and $800 a ton, but they figure within 10 years, they'll be able to reduce it to $200, but by the year 2050, in Canada's CCUS strategy that was developed, those costs come down. Those costs come down on all these technologies on commercialization. We talk about the different colors and different production processes of hydrogen but hydrogen again is clean. When you burn hydrogen, you have water as a byproduct. But how we get there, again, what might work good in Northeast United States or perhaps in California, California and Arizona are gonna have a real tough time manufacturing and building green hydrogen because of the water shortage. You need a lot of water. You need seven kilograms of water to produce a kilogram of hydrogen. Lots, and it has to be purified water. So a state like California, for example, if you think that you could simply desalinate the water, well, that just adds to the, the economic burden of that. So why not use a technology that is going to be, A, more economical and available? But you can't have blue hydrogen without having storage capacity for CCS. So you have to have those geological surveys done. And like the province of Ontario that uh, Simone was talking about, the province of Ontario is very hard rock. It's part of the Canadian Shield. There's no storage capacity other than deep under the Great Lakes. And there's not an appetite right now from the public, unfortunately, to, to, to use that technology there. So, but there is just south of the border in the state of Michigan and through Pennsylvania and whatnot, there's lots of storage. But where I come from as a Canadian in the province of Alberta, that prairie region, has 10,000 years of storage capacity for CO2. It's incredible. So that's why I say you have to use what's going to be important and what you can use regionally versus this one-stop shopping that, hey, we have to do green hydrogen or nothing. You can't do that. You can't run an economy based on one idea of one type of a developmental technology. These are the comparisons. Again, Green hydrogen does work, electrolyzers work, but they're very, very expensive. But there's investments going in, in, into the commercialization or trying to scale these uh, electrolyzers up. The United States Department of Energy is putting a few billion dollars towards it. Canada will be investing in it. It's all really good. But again, it's not the one-stop shop. So as a boilermaker welder by trade, we've recently, com we've recently co completed a transition from burning our coal in all of our coal-fired units, and we're in natural gas right now. But the next phase of that is going to be taking natural gas as a feedstock, creating blue hydrogen, and of course capturing the CO2 because that region is blessed with storage capacity, and the technology works. It's a little exhausting to hear that we're still trying to find the proven technology of carbon capture, but if you come to where I live, We'll show you how it works because we're capturing a million ton per year of not just from the Shell Quest project that we built, Boilermakers built, and we maintain, but also a plant that very few people even talk about, and it was the world's largest hydrogen production facility for blue hydrogen because the plant was designed from the ground up 
to put carbon capture in a gasification process. And again, Northwest Refinery with the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, that's the world's first hub cluster. So there's a lot of talk right now about doing these hub clusters to share costs on infrastructure. But the reality is, is that we already have this stuff proven. So I would invite anyone to come to my home province and we'd be gladly take you a tour and show you how this stuff, how it works and how it's proven. But this is what we need to do more importantly now than ever if we're gonna move forward, if we truly believe in climate change and we do view the IPCC as a governing authority to mitigate climate change, we have to work together. We can't be doing what we're doing because it's not working. We're doing lots of talking, but we're not pulling on the same rope in the same direction as where we need to go. We need these collaborative efforts if we're gonna have any type of a successful future in addressing CO2 for our kids and our grandkids and our families and the whole planet. But it can't be just one nation doing it. If we're in it to win it, then we all have to be part of that. Again, this is collaboration. So we try to align ourselves with like-minded people and our organization has gone out over the last several years and gotten educated on these different technologies, what will work, what doesn't work, but again, we support all these different energy industries because they've helped build pretty comfortable lives for all of us in all the things that we're wearing and living and sitting in and we get to have these big TVs and live decent lives, but we're always trying to, we're always trying to do better and we're trying to make lives for people better and this is what's going to happen and this is what we're gonna do. This is the direction this is going in whether people like it or not. Some people might not be happy with it, but that's the direction it's going. But anyways, that's a short presentation from the Boilermakers, and I, and I really thank you for your patience and your time, and I'd gladly take any questions uh, through the moderator if, if there are any. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias a los tres, Sari, Zash, Cori. Well, thank you very much for that presentation, Corey, and after your presentation, that was very um, interesting. I imagine that some of the people here may have some questions that they may want to put forward. If so, you have the opportunity. Go ahead. Buenas, eh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank uh, UTT FICA and, Anastasia, and the Foundation Anastasia de Gracia for organizing this conference. And I would like to thank the speakers and congratulate them for their talks because of the enthusiasm that they put to it and because of the quality and clarity of their presentation. I'm Jose Luis Alperijoves. I am a representative of the workers of the energy chemical mining and food sector in Asturias, which is very close to the Basque Country in the north of Spain, very close to where we are. And I have a question for the three of you. First, well, Diana said this initially, a small nuance. There's a nuance between energy transition and fair transition. There's a difference. And for that, you need the participation of workers or workers' representatives or the need for social dialogue. So my question is, in your areas, in your unions, is there any renewable hydrogen strategy or any fair transition strategy? And within that strategy or roadmap, what does your participation look like? What is the participation of your organizations? How are you participating in dialogue with the governments or with the um, employers? I'm not sure if you could explain exactly what that participation looks like and how much you participate in the decision making. Uh, well, back here we've had a roadmap published by the government on hydrogen and here in Spain and there are social dialogue um, committees. So that's the question I have for the three of you. Thank you. Me first? Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, for us, in Australia, we have hydrogen strategies for every state 
uh, and also federally. We haven't got a roadmap. Uh, we haven't had the just transition talk. Uh, fortunately for us, after nine years of, uh, of a government that uh, did everything in its power to crush unions, we have just uh, recently voted in a Labor government uh, and that will be a big uh, factor in us having a voice at the table in terms of the energy, in terms of the jobs and the just transition. Uh, currently, as I uh, addressed in my presentation, collaborate, collaboration between energy producers and unions in Australia isn't uh, a default position, but because the hydrogen industry or sector in Australia is in its infancy and we are planning it out, uh, it might be a great opportunity for us with that Labor government and the interest in hydrogen to start those conversations. So we don't yet have a position uh, at the table in these discussions, but we are hopeful that we can get a position at that table and, and be able to contribute to that uh, process. Microphone on. There we go. I can hear myself. Canada is going to be um, tabling a just transition act. The uh, stakeholders, meaning uh, workers, labor, unions, as well as employers and, uh, and other stakeholders, um, have been in discussions for at least two years. We've had consultations up to here. We want to see action now from our Canadian government and we have been given commitments that they will table a just transition act by, the, by fall. So we're anticipating something by October, perhaps by the next COP27 meeting, we'll have that uh, just transition act that will give all stakeholders a roadmap. How do you have these discussions as you transform work in your, uh, in your particular sectors? Um, hydrogen discussions, as I showed the roadmap of what the Natural Resources Canada has put together, um, we are part of those committee discussions. Um, it's infancy stage for us being part of those discussions, but we have been. But of course, bigger discussions in the past and today and into the future will take place in collective bargaining. In the energy sector, we have an uh, energy table where there is a master agreement that's developed and job security, uh, the transition, the transformation of work will be discussed at those tables. And so it is ongoing. We're looking at all of the levers that are available to us, collective bargaining, uh, the legislative acts that are available, and also the um, uh, social dialogue outside of collective bargaining as well, those labor relations that we've been able to, uh, to produce in, uh, in our relationships with the employers. Just to add a little bit to the um, Canadian component that we're currently working with a ministerial office and a standing committee on uh, climate change and sustainable development. Um, we're part of an advisory group and just transition is part of that, but all these different solutions um, to, to A, keep a, a, a vibrant economy and a vibrant energy industry have to be part of that solution. And we have to be mindful that, you know, just transition and the concept of just transition, that no one's talking about how some people may be affected by this and what's gonna happen to their pension plans? What's gonna happen uh, to these organizations and these workers where uh, example like the Canadian Labour Congress has done studies um, from the coal miners in, in my home province where they've lost their jobs and domestic violence has dramatically increased and, 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 and uh, drug use and, and things like that. That's not just. The miners in southern Saskatchewan um, received $300 each to prepare a resume for when they lost their jobs. So that's not just transition. So, but we are having these conversations but these types of energy processes such as hydrogen and utilizing carbon capture technology have to be in that equation or there's nothing just about anything and there will be nothing but job losses. It's important to preserve the environment but it's also to preserve your economy and there's a way to do that because we do have solutions. The United States is developing and working on the same thing. The, the politics are obviously more dynamic but 
it's going to take time to build these things. As the old saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day, but it's going to take time. And is this really a, a transition? It's more of an evolution because we don't know what type of energy production is going to take place 20, 30 years from now. But we know what we have now and we know what works. So that's what we have to use. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much to the three of you. I'm not sure whether there's anyone that has any question. Yes, I have a question. Good afternoon. Thank you very much to UGT FICA and especially to Gustavo and Pedro for inviting us to this convention. My name is Ana Benita. I'm the Human Resources Director of ACCIONA Energy. And in our company, in ACCIONA, we work for this energy revolution that we are talking about. Our main concern is about people because we can reach our goals and objectives without the employees being happy, being well paid and being safe. And in this case, my question is for Zach and for Corey because in both countries we are developing wind and solar farms and hopefully in the future sometimes uh, we can go through hydrogen too. We are finding very hard to find some uh, employees to recruit and hire them, sometimes due to the phenomenon of the great resignation that we know, but in, on the other hand, sometimes uh, our problem is because they don't have enough uh, knowledge or enough skills for the jobs that we need right now. So my question is, what do you think could be the best solution to, de to develop this new knowledge or these skills to requalify the workforce that we have right now in order to work for this new future that we have to work all together for this. Thank you very much. If I, I, I apologize, if I got your question correct, you wanted to know how um, you, you can attract and, and retain this workforce in, in, in installation of solar panels and whatnot. It's all about money at the end of the day. So you have to pay these people appropriately. So in that, when we talk about just transition, we take an oil and gas worker who's paid well. You have to pay them well to do solar installations or wind farms or any other technology. Yeah, people have to be paid well and rightfully so. But where's that sweet spot? So I think it's really important that, you know, the vast array of, of, of different types of technologies that are available, and it's not just about installing solar panels, but everything else. If it's about energy production, then these, these, these jobs should be well-paid jobs. We need to take care of these people because they're taking care of us. I hope that helps a little bit, but it's gonna take a campaign, and I don't think there's any nation right now who's not feeling a skilled work sh worker shortage and unless somebody could prove me wrong, but we have those challenges in the United States and Canada. You, I'm sure you have them here as well, but there's a way to retract this workforce. There's lots of jobs available, but I think in the energy industry, I think promoting it as a career and offering uh, a, um, a retirement with some dignity is gonna be really important because that's what people work hard for and that's what they deserve. I hope that helps. Am I on? Yep. yep. Sorry. Just to add to that, yes. Uh, it's about security of employment as well. So um, obviously it is all about the money, as uh, Corey said. But if you're going to attract workers from uh, another industry, say oil and gas, oil and gas workers are well paid. Um, so in, in that aspect, you need to attract them using the same money, but also a lot of oil and gas workers, the contractors, they don't have secure employment. They're casual employees. Uh, they don't have a long-term engagement with their employer. So secure, direct employment is very, very attractive to workers in uh, resources, uh, particularly in Australia. We've had a, a kind of a, a segmentalization where the producer will employ a few hundred people, but then they will contract out a lot of the maintenance, they'll contract out a lot of the turnarounds and shutdowns and things like that. So you've got highly skilled people working there, uh, but 
they're only there for the shutdown, which may be six months, and then they have to be looking for work again. So secure, ongoing, direct employment is always a huge bonus uh, to workers in the uh, resources sector in Australia, at least. I just want to add one thing as well is, how are you promoting your next generation of workers? And that starts from uh, at, at the education level, in the schools, of career direction, and it's really creating that excitement of what are the future jobs? What are the skills that are needed for that? How are you contributing? It's really looking at those psychosocial factors of I'm adding value to my community, I'm adding value to my own life, I'm being recognized for my contributions. Those go a, a long way in, uh, in attracting next generation of workers. Muchísimas gracias a los tres. ¿Hay alguna... Thank you to the three of you. Are there any other questions you would like to ask? Jose Manuel, go ahead. Disculpe. Sorry. Down there, please. I have the, the micro, microphone here. Ah, vale. Bueno, sí. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Perdón. Thank you. Uh, I have a question to, uh, to Zach and to Diana at the same time. Diana. Uh, my name is Jean-Louis Valls. I, am, uh, I work in a public administration uh, cross -border, in charge of cross-border cooperation between France and Spain. In charge of, and I, I am some project between hydrogen and uh, capture and storage uh, carbon. So I explain my presence here. My question is, uh, Zach, you, you shown that for the uh, Desert Bloom project, you have a, an objective of uh, $2 a kilo for 2027. But Diana earlier shown us that uh, um, we only reach $2 by uh, 2050. So that means that compet competing with the gasoline will be uh, faster than expected, or who is uh, too optimistic or too pessimistic? I think uh, likely it's too optimistic. Uh, so because of this, the, the stage that Australia is currently at with hydrogen, we've been just bombarded with announcements the, um, of what can happen, what's going to happen. And these huge numbers are being thrown around, the, the 50 gigawatt uh, solar and wind farm, the 26 gigawatt, and this, this Desert Bloom one is, is 10 uh, gigawatt in total. So I think that the proponents of that project are aiming very high, and it's unlikely that they will get that $2 a kilo by 2027. Uh, and I think that the, the research that uh, Industrial has done is likely to be far more accurate than what um, a business that is trying to promote itself and uh, get grant money, get major project status within the, the, the territory that it's uh, establishing itself and, and get itself in there and producing, um, I think that obviously there's going to be some bias and some shooting for the, shooting for the moon on that. Muchas gracias, José Manuel. Thank you, José Manuel. Sí, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Jose Manuel Rodríguez, and I am a member of Acerinox, which is a steel making uh, company for uh, Inox Steel. And my question is, or well, stainless steel, my question is for the last speaker. Don't you think that the current obstacles for the fair transition is that the current workers are working? with a uh, technology and a fuels uh, that are, will be obsolete, that the transition to hydrogen will not give them the opportunity to be trained on the new technologies, and that at least uh, future workers, as our colleague uh, has said, it will only be future workers that through university studies will be able to adapt to new technologies, but that the current workforce 
will not be able to adapt because uh, till the end of their days they will be working with the current technologies and they will not have time to be trained because there will be no period or inactivity, we could say, to be trained. Is that to me? Ah. Yes, sorry. Um, pero, perdón, creo que la pregunta iba directamente para Cori. I don't know if it was a question for Cori. The, um, depending on the type of craft and, and, and skilled workforce and, and trade background that you have, you already have these skills uh, to be able to manufacture these, these different um, technical components, such as uh, regardless of, of, of what type of hydrogen you're making. I know, like, at least for the craft that I belong to for 36 years now, and as a welder, we, we already have the ability to do this. So there's no training required. It's just you know, the initiative and the investment and all those other things where we can just put boots on the ground and start to move forward with this stuff. Because again, the debate's over. We already know what works, let's start doing it. But again, from the young lady up there who had the question, we also have to have a large skilled workforce to do that. So when we have different people unnamed who are saying, hey, don't take these jobs in this horrible fossil fuel industry, that's not going to serve the economy any good whatsoever because there's not all these renewable energy jobs. Like when you build a wind farm, that's it. There's people in a control room. You don't have the same type of a workforce that you would have in the refinery or in a powerhouse or in a gas-fired unit. You just don't have that. So, but we have an opportunity because I think while investment is starting to come in and regulations are coming in, into play, we have an opportunity to recruit and train if you have to. So, but for, for some craft, they're already ready to go. We're good to go. So hopefully that will help answer some of this. And, and also to add to that, I think there is an advantage in current energy producers uh, entering into hydrogen or, or dabbling in hydrogen. So for, for example, we have an operator called Gemina in Australia who um, basically has a lot of the gas pipelines on the eastern seaboard um, and they're starting to produce hydrogen and blend that into the current uh, natural gas mix. Uh, the advantage is there with the pilot programs and starting small and expanding if it works is that they will get workers from their current uh, operations, the gas operations, and bring them across and train them in the in hydrogen and what the and the additional requirements of that. And I know that at one of the sites, the, the Western Sydney site, where we have good uh, union members and good union density, uh, we've just finished bargaining with that company as well for that site. And what we've reached agreement on is certain training to be performed uh, at the company's cost of those uh, of those members, and also for those members to be paid an additional allowance for entering into that new sector and being part of this, of this project. So I think that when we have, uh, say, a huge project just instantly popping up, we're going to have, uh, you're going to have recruitment issues, you're going to have training issues, but when we're looking at these small scale uh, projects that are coming up from gas, uh, we actually do have an opportunity then to bring people who are already in the workforce along give them the appropriate training or make sure that appropriate training is provided and also remunerate them for that uh, for their efforts. Will anyone else like to ask another question? We can hardly see with the spotlight. Will anyone take the floor? Will anyone like to ask a question? Yes. 
I'm Loya Herrera. I'm a representative of the company called Gamesa, and I would like to ask a question as to how you store CO2. What are the dangers associated? What type of safety you have in place so that it won't escape? Because it's a gas, and gas is naturally unstable. So how well developed is this technology of storage? I love that question. Because that's what everyone is led to believe, that A, the technology is unproven, and you can't store this stuff. So when there was a slide, and I think it was Simone that mentioned it, and I, I talked about ShellQuest, they're injecting CO2 into the ground, either into saline aquifers or into the Permian Basin. It's not this cave that's underground. It's actually in the rock. So there's different options. Some people choose to use enhanced oil recovery for it, because enhanced oil recovery is actually pretty good. If you want to produce oil, it's 87% less emissions from any other form of oil extraction. That's, that's pretty incredible. But Shell Quest, for example, safely stores this now for seven years, um, and they monitor the, the plume two, three kilometers underground 10 times more than what the, what the government, not just federally and provincially, 10 times more. So when you think about how deep this is and all the different things that have been underground and pressurized for millions of years, the CO2 is staying down there. It's not coming back up. It's safe. And people need to, again, come to these types of projects where you see this stuff actually working and talk to the, the experts and the operations people and the environmental groups and the government affairs people who all have open and transparent books to show you what they're doing, but it is safely stored. But you have to have those geological surveys. It serves no purpose to just drill a hole in the ground and, and think that you can pump CO2 in there without doing proper studies. It takes time. But yes, CO2 is safely stored, deep, deep, deep underground. It's not coming back up. More questions? Hola, buenas tardes. Hello, I'm called Dos Sanchez and I'm responsible of the automobile industry in Euskadi here at the Basque Country. And after uh, seeing your presentations and after Here, in all the things we've said about the transformation during the q and I'm thinking about several studies that I've read on the automobile industry done by DJ Metal in Germany, talking about the loss of jobs that could entail the industrial transformation towards the electric vehicle. And I would like to know what's going on in your countries, that if it, your trade unions, you have any possible estimations about the uh, jobs that could be lost in this industrial transformation? For coming to our country, um, I will hope that uh, you will stay here in our country a good, a good stay. Thank you very much. I can start that answer. Um, we. Unifor is made up of two legacy unions, one of them being the Canadian auto workers. So we have a huge uh, component of, uh, of auto workers within our union, and that is what keeps me up at night and keeps our leadership up at night is that work transformation. Because there's no um, denying that a electric vehicle will need less components than an internal a combustion engine. That's just uh, reality. And so we now have to work with um, uh, our membership, with the employers, um, with the uh, components manufacturers of how are we building that, um, that um, continuum of production and who is going to be part of it. Less members are going to be part of it. And that's what we have to relay to our members as we are putting that industrial vision together of what this means. Because internal combustion uh, engine cars 
are going to be going to the wayside. So you're going to have to be building the new generation of mobility and what does that entail and how are you going to be part of that. So that does mean making some of those difficult uh, decisions and we've all made those difficult decisions as our industries have gone into uh, a downswing, those valleys that we've all been part of. How do you protect the workers during those valleys as they start mounting into the peaks? Hopefully there are some, some peaks that you can reach. So that's through collective bargaining. That's working with the federal and provincial governments. We can't just do it on the backs of workers of collective bargaining. I don't have numbers to give to you exactly what this is. We're putting an auto policy together. We are doing a, uh, a video as well of the affected workers at the General Motors plant that is, as we speak, transforming into electric vehicles. That video will be available in, uh, in August when we have our constitutional convention. I will send a link to that video uh, to Deanna and then you can share it with, um, with the participants here. And that will give the perspective from the workers as they're transitioning. And we'll also have our auto policy that will be published at the same time that will lay out our footprint and how we're going to look after those members that will not be able to transform, or they may be able to transform, and how do we find those paths for them? So it, it needs to be a very open and frank discussion. It's not about, we're gonna get jobs for you. It's not, it's an open and honest discussion of what's gonna be taking place. And, uh, and hearing from the workers as well. Communities are involved as well, and how does that affect those communities? So it is a work in progress, and we're very much um, aware that it is going to be a difficult path for us to walk. But it is a path that we need to take in order to have a uh, survival, an opportunity to survive in the uh, automotive sector. Did you want to add anything, Corey? Muchas gracias, segundo. Perdona, Margarita. Vamos a dar dos palabras más porque cuesta. Just a couple of words more, because we've only got uh, a little bit of time. Margarita and then Pedro. Just very briefly, thank you very much for your uh, invitation. I'm Margarita Maitus from TEPSA. And this afternoon, we've talked a lot about fair transition and training. And I think that our colleagues from Andalusia, the south of Spain, well, we have also a large presence in the oil and gas sector. And it's just a reflection, a thought. I think all the social players must be able, through collective bargaining, as our colleague from Canada said, and I mean, they have a long tradition and a lot of strength and ability to do it, I think that here in Spain, and especially in the industrial sector, we will also be able, through collective bargaining, to reach agreements between companies, I'm sure with the help of the administration, of the public administration, to also give the training that our workers need. They are workers from a complex industry, such as oil and gas. So I, I am sure that uh, through training, uh, enabled by all the stakeholders, we will be able to move towards, they will be able to move towards hydrogen plants and the future. And I think that's what we have to do together. That's all, thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Margarita. Pedro? Sí. Buenas tardes. Okay, good afternoon. Rather than a question, it's a thought. I think tomorrow at the closing session, I'll be able to talk about our position as an organization. But there was a little discussion on when will the green hydrogen will be competitive, whether it will be in 2027 or in 2050, as Diana said. What I would like to say and let people, you know, food for thought, is that the realities in each country, 
I mean, in the case of Europe, we could even talk about a continent. The realities of each continent are different. You come from three countries that export energy. Currently, Europe, well, we now have a problem that has been exacerbated due to our energy dependence from the country, we all know, from Russia, or the problem that we have, the lack of reliability. Um, we don't know what may happen in terms of Russia. We also receive a lot of our energy supply from Arab countries with um, the certainty that they give you, you know, uh, in the case of Spain from Algeria. So we are importing products that come also from your countries. And when I hear I'm talking about fossil fuels. So Europe and Spain specifically, for us, it is extremely important to evolve and to work towards these energies because the foreign dependency that we have right now, I mean, everyone knows that without energy, this cannot work. Nothing works. We know that. that. Then there's the type of energy that we choose, taking into consideration the environmental problem and also the energy dependency. We need to have energy certainty as well. So what I want to say, and I'm sure that you have said this, we may go at different speeds. And, you know, this is not going to be one size fits all, as we say. This means that each country, even um, at a European level, at a continent level, will go at different speeds. And it will be also depending on how urgent it is for us. We all know that Europe and Spain particularly, we are quite on the hot spot here. You know, we are feeling the pressure, the pressure of energy supply and energy certainty and also everything that has to do with environmental aspects. And that's just something I, gave, I wanted to give in terms of food for thought. There is no point talking about dates, future dates, because this, uh, like, we don't have a crystal ball. But I am optimistic. I think that hydrogen will be a renewable energy source that will be um, a pleasant surprise for us all. I'm quite looking forward to, listen also, to listening also to our Japanese and um, German colleagues, because I don't think this is going to be the same spe speed or the same line for all of us. I think there's going to be different developments as well in Europe, I think, and the regional minister of the Basque Country said it, and also the uh, minister for Spain said that when we invest resources to, for R&D, this will accelerate. I mean, with the current situation, we will not get to 2050. I think we will need a huge acceleration. And I'm speaking here as a European, as a Spaniard. It will be very important for us in terms of environmental emissions, but also in terms of energy certainty. So thank you very much, energy security. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for your presentations. They were of great interest to us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pedro. And stop saying thanks. I am the one who has to say the thanks. I would like to thank the three members of the panel to, who gave us their opinion and their um, viewpoints. Uh, Sari, thank you very much. Sack, thank you very much. And Corey, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the three of you. And thank you very much for also putting up with me, because sometimes I'm not so easy. And I'll give the floor to my colleague to conclude the session today. Well, after this interesting panel and the debate it led to, I hope, uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank Sari, uh, Gustav for uh, chairing, Corey and Zach. And I'm going to just summarize, I mean, it's not my role, but I am thinking about what D Diana said and what Mikhail Vis uh, Vasilia said. about. He, they said nothing about us without us. I think there's the involvement of trade unions and the involvement of all the workers in this transition is very important to try and make sure it's as fair as possible. Without us, nothing should be done. So now we are going to have a 14 hour and 30 minute break. So we'll start tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning with uh, the uh, regional manager for UGT, uh, 
of uh, the Basque country and also with the president of the regional Basque government. Thank you very much and please be here on time tomorrow.